Everybody's got a price, it's the million dollar man What's up, everybody? It's Marcus D'Angelo. We are back for another episode of Everybody's Got a Pod. And, of course, I could not do it without the man himself, WWE Hall of Famer, forever the Million Dollar Champion, Ted DiBiase. What's going on, Ted? Marcus, it's another day. You know, it's kind of like uh, somebody uh, was out taking a little walk earlier and said, how you feeling this morning, Dad? I said, like a million bucks. The podcast here is rolling like a million dollar podcast. Things are going great. Our downloads are up. Views on YouTube are up, so everything's going really well here, and we're going to keep the train rolling, brother, because we this week we are picking up where we left off on the story of your time in WCW. So we last talked about February 1997 and the Super Brawl pay-per-view where Rowdy Roddy Piper broke out of Alcatraz. And this time we're catching up to April 97 and Spring Stampede. There's plenty to talk about, and I cannot wait to get into these notes Near the end of February in 1997, Ken Shamrock is going to sign with the WWF after reportedly being torn between remaining in shoot fighting, going to New Japan, or WCW. So at this point, Ken Shamrock has started out in wrestling before establishing himself as a big star in UFC, and now he's back in wrestling with a really high-profile spot. Ted, I, I don't know if you would have ever crossed paths with Ken. Do you remember ever meeting him? I, I, I met him, but in terms of... Uh wrestling and what have you that you know uh, i never i was never in the ring with him uh and i mean i'll be honest with you he wasn't around enough for me to even remember if he if he could work at all he was pretty good uh you know i don't think that he was like a super crazy ring technician but like he had some skills and man like some of his facial reactions and stuff were really really great yeah. Um, I know that during the early part of his wrestling training, he was actually nearly killed by the Nasty Boys in a shoot fight where they, they attacked him outside the ring and beat him up pretty bad. And now here he is, and he's like, yeah. he's, he's a badass dude. What was that? See, now, that, that's something, you know, you, you know here we are, we're, we're, we're doing the podcast, and I'm going, why did, how did I miss that? What happened was, uh, apparently he was at the bar with both Knobs and Sags, uh, at the hotel that they were staying at. And uh, uh, reportedly, one of the nasty boys was inappropriate with a woman at the bar. Ken Shamrock kind of called him out on it, and uh, they did not take kindly to it. And here, later on, Shamrock, I think, goes to the room to confront them about it. And as soon as the door is open, Ken st st uh, steps in, and he gets hit in the back of the head with, with like the hotel phone. They were waiting for him. Yeah. So they, they drill him with the phone, and he's down and out, and they're thinking, oh, boy, we might have really critically injured this guy. And then, reportedly, they had the idea that they were going to throw him over the balcony to make it look like he had fallen off of a balcony. Oh, <laughs> gosh. You've never heard that one? No. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So it's a crazy story. And apparently Ken really held a grudge. And he saw them years later when he got into wrestling and tried to approach them. And they both kind of begged off, which is probably really smart, because at that point, Ken was uh, called the most dangerous man in the world. And there was a good reason for it. He was a very, very well trained fighter. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So pretty wild stuff. But really, you know, I, 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 I remember I met Ken, you know, and, uh, and very likable guy. I, I do remember that, but, you know, I just never had any, you know, uh, business wise, you know, uh, you know, we were never teamed up. We never had, we, I never wrestled him. So. Yeah. You know. It seems like the two of you would have never really crossed paths that much, but you know, talking about Ken, it does kind of raise another question that I'm interested in with you. You know, Ken obviously started in wrestling, but generally speaking, when a guy from another sport makes a jump into wrestling, is he welcomed by the boys or not so much? I, I would think uh, to some degree guys resent it. Um, uh, you could have been a, uh, like, again, uh, Muhammad Ali, you know, one of the greatest boxers of all time, you know, but you put him in the ring, you know, uh, as a wrestler and, you know, it's a whole different, it's a whole different thing. 
but the bottom line is, uh, it, irregardless, I mean, I don't care who you are. It's kind of like, uh, uh, it's kind of like if I decided I was going to go and, and put the gloves on, be a boxer. Okay. If, if I could box and I looked good, you know, okay, maybe, you know, but nine times out of 10, those, those guys, those guys that crossed over, the, the, how many of them made it, made it big? Very few. Very few. Steve Mongo McMichael was probably the most successful. Yeah. But even he, he wasn't like, he wasn't a great worker, but he was just a great personality. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good, a good Mike man. Yes, exactly. Just over the top personality. One of the, and uh, you know, I've heard a lot of the guys say that they respected him just because he was a man's man. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, well, coming into March 1997, WCW put on a show the fans would come to really love for the aesthetic value of it. WCW Spring Breakout at Club La Vila. These were the episodes of Nitro where the ring was actually set up in a swimming pool at an outdoor nightclub surrounded by a bunch of drunk college kids. Uh, and reportedly... I remember it well. Do you really? Yeah. Well, I, re- I, rem- I remember the location. And oh my gosh, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the atmosphere was great, but I mean, it was just, you know, um, uh, I don't know, just, you know, for, for wrestling, uh, I don't know, it, you know, it didn't suit me. You know, wrestling fans are conditioned to behave a particular way most of the time, boo the heels, uh, cheer the baby faces, that sort of thing. When you get in front of like a bunch of college, a bunch of drunk college students, I don't know if they're going to help you enhance the storyline very much, right? Yeah, correct. The show at Club La Vila is really kind of notable because reportedly and pretty obviously, if you watch it back, it appears that a number of the wrestlers are really drunk during this situation because it, it's spring break in Panama City. Yeah. And, uh, man, the guys were kind of cutting loose. I know that your partying days were over or pretty much in the rear view by this point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, but rumor has it that a lot of the guys would be drinking ahead of the show and possibly hang out in Hogan's trailer and kind of soak up the atmosphere. Uh, at this point, uh, by 1997, did that also mean, so obviously you, you turned around the way that you were behaving on the road, but did yeah. that also mean that you were, you had stopped drinking? Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'd still, you know, like have a, a beer or two or, 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 or what, 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 you know, you know, uh, but yeah, by and large, you know, the, 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 all the, the party and, and all that, all the wild stuff, but that was that was that was gone. That was just behind me, big time. Now it's and look if if you want me to cut this out of the podcast, I will. But you know, just a general curiosity. It's I know that your drug use. You know, you were never really into um, like marijuana or anything like that. I know that you you had told me that you would experiment with stuff like uh, speed or bennies, as they call them. Yeah. Um, did you ever like? Did you experiment with anything else? You know, I uh, and this was back. Um, like when I, when I first met Melanie, um, which was, um, in 81, you know, and I was in Atlanta, Georgia, it's, it's kind of like, uh, okay. Um, cocaine. Okay. Now, um, I would do, I mean, it's like, and actually before I went to Atlanta, uh, you know, uh, you know, junkyard dog and I, uh, we're very good friends and, and J and JYD, he got to where he would, you know, he was doing a per, you know, got a pretty good habit of cocaine going on. Yes. You know, I even tried to at one point, uh, say, Hey man, it's, you know, you're hitting it too hard. And, you know, and then I just finally realized, you know, I was gonna, you know, but, you know, but to say that, yeah, I mean, I, I, I did some Coke. Um, uh, I mean, that. Yeah, the thing about it for me, it wasn't, it wasn't like, it wasn't something I would, and I didn't sit around and do cocaine all day. I would, you know, what it was for me was, well, it was a stimulant. And so if I'm making a long road, you know, I got a hike and I'm going to be up at the two or three or four o'clock in the morning driving, you know, I would take a couple snorts of Coke and I was wide eyed Bushdale. Never got big into it never like you know oh my gosh i'm i'm, I'm a habitual coke you know it was, it was very rare uh, and like any anything else um 
Uh, I mean, I was just, you know, I, I had a mother. My mother uh, was an alcoholic. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to follow, you know, I am an alcoholic, drug addict, you know, um, so they actually say it skips a generation. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but by the grace of God, I wasn't, you know, I, I, I was never addicted to any alcohol or beer, or whatever, uh, you know, nothing. But I would, like, again, even like with the, what they call Benny's, the, like, it was some kind of speed with these pills when you take, take the, take the pill and you're, you're wide eyed and until you need it. I mean, you know, you know, truck drivers would take that stuff all the time. Right. You know, so. Anyway. so okay. So, yeah. So using Coke, it was never really a habit. It was more like it was, it was like a, a function of being on the road, which, you know, happened to be recreational sometimes. Yeah. I got yeah. you. Okay. Um, this episode of Nitro is also where it's announced that Dennis Rodman is now officially a member of the NWO. So in a short period of time, the WWF gets a big star from the world of the UFC and WCW is getting one of the biggest and most controversial athletes in the world at the at the time. Yeah. Uh, did, did you feel like adding Dennis Rodman enhanced the NWO presentation or was it already so red hot that he wasn't really necessary? Uh, I, you know... <sighs> I, I don't know how much it did for it. I mean, it was, it, it was, I think it was, you know, it was pretty good on its own. And, and of course that was the, the biggest thing, the biggest, like uh, the biggest angle in professional wrestling was not anything the WWF was doing or anything that WCW was doing. The big, biggest angle was the war between the two companies. Mm -hmm. That's what kept everybody, uh, glued to the TV because they're going, they're swipping, switching back and forth every week, watching, they're watching both of us. If folks are flipping back and forth, having a guy like Dennis Rodman on TV is probably not a terrible thing to have, you know, where all of a sudden people are going to stop and say, Whoa, Holy smoke. Yeah. Like, did you interact a lot with Dennis Rodman? Like, what did you think of having him? Well, you know, I said hello, uh, you know, you know, uh, decent guy, I guess, you know, I, I didn't spend a lot of time around him, but yeah, he was okay. Um, on this show also, Roddy Piper is going to go on a rant type promo during which he'll acknowledge the WWF. Apparently the, the week prior on Raw, Jim Ross was knocking WCW, calling them the seniors tour, the over 40 promotion, and mentioned that he didn't believe there were any wrestlers in the WWF with only one hip, which uh, of course Piper just had hip surgery. So Piper will remind everyone that he worked a match at WrestleMania the year prior and defeated Gold Dust. Nowadays, Ted, acknowledging the competition is pretty commonplace, but back then it did not happen very often. No. What's your take on it when com when companies mention their rivals on TV? Do you think it's good well, business? I mean, uh, yeah, hey, you know, it, 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 it's a war. <laughs> so hey, if you got to go for it, go for it. So, you know. This promo from Piper also reminds me, work shoot promos really became a thing for the first time during this period and will grow in popularity during the late 90s. You know, as a guy who grew up in wrestling, Ted, do you think a work shoot is good business if done properly or a bad decision to make this kind of distinction between these type promos uh, versus normal wrestling promos? Uh, I don't know. I, it's kind of like... Uh... If you do the, pro, I, you know, it, it depends on, you know, who's listening. I guess the average fan, I don't think it would know the difference to you. Well, it's, you know, sometimes it's like this was also the era of smart fans, right? A lot of people were reading the Observer newsletter. And so they knew some of the behind the scenes stuff. So when a guy would kind of mix reality with uh, with work. Uh, the fans are like, oh, okay, is that is that a work or is that a shoot that this guy is calling this yeah. other guy out? So it's like it, it, it creates intrigue. But then, you know, later on in the program, when somebody just does a regular wrestling promo, the, the fans tune out because they're like, oh, well, that, that's that's just storyline. What that guy said earlier was real. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, you know, personally, I think, you know, business is business. Take care of business and keep your personal shit out of it. I agree. I, I think that we blurred the lines a little bit too much during this era. Yeah, and I, you know, and of course, you know, I never did anything like that in any in any of my interviews. I I was gonna say there is zero chance of you ever doing a work shoot promo. I just cannot picture it. Yeah. Dude. Um. Well, 
the the whole thing here is a uh, setup for uncensored pay-per-view which is coming up here but before we get there i did want to ask you about another piece of news from this time and it's about your uh, buddy and former tag team partner steve williams but it is not good news steve williams and two travel companions are going to get arrested at the laredo international airport and are charged with felony possession of controlled substance with drugs which included 80 boxes of neopercadan 17 boxes of valium 16 boxes of halcyon 15 boxes of Tamajesic, I think it's is how you pronounce it, 26 boxes of Darvon, and 8 boxes of Richerville. So, man, that is a lot of drugs that he was bringing across the border or wherever it was he was coming from. And by all accounts, Steve Williams, a fantastic guy, um, but drug issues were pretty common fare back in these days. You knew Steve really well. Would you say that you recognize any red flags in his extracurricular activities? Uh, you know... When Steve and I, you know, because Bill Watts tagged us up, and the reason Bill put Steve with me is that, you know, he wanted me to help bring Steve along. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. We call it the rub. You know, you know, you you, you take a guy who's uh, relatively new, but you know, he's got, you know, he's, you know, he's, you know, he's he's well known in the area. You know, a starting offensive. Uh, football player for the Oklahoma Sooners and all that stuff and legitimately uh, a tough guy yeah and legitimately a, a really nice guy um, and so that's why I think Bill put Steve with me was to help him along and he did he he, he learned it pretty quick but uh, you know the only thing I ever knew in terms of of uh you know, I, you know, again, you're, you, this news, you, that, that, that's news to me. I never heard that ever. I never heard that, 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 that Steve Williams and whoever came across the border with that much stuff. Never heard that. So, I mean, this is news to you, but when you're running around with him out on the road and, you know, making the miles, as they say, uh, like, did you see him using, like, a lot of drugs or, I mean, everybody was using drugs back then. Well, I mean, I mean basically, to, just to make the trips, I mean, uh, um, and, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, there were a couple of times when we'd pull over on the side of the road because, I told him I'm about to fall asleep and he would just, he'd give me a Benny or, or, or whatever it was, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I mean, and, and again, uh, I never was, you know, I was never, I, you know, I never got into any of that stuff as it, it being a daily part of my life. Right. It was, it was only as needed. If I'm going to make a, you know, it's, it's kind of like, uh, I can remember one Thanksgiving where, um, um, I mean, we actually, we had our Thanksgiving dinner and I got in the car and I drove from Jackson to New Orleans to wrestle because we were wrestling on Thanksgiving night. And, you know, and I, you know, uh, you know, I mean, have dinner, get, you know, with the family and then have to get in the car and drive 200 miles, you know, and, and so, you know, and of, and of course I would take something to, to so I would make sure uh, but I was going to stay awake to get home, to get home safe. But other than that, no, I didn't take recreational drugs. I mean, I didn't, uh, uh, you know, I guess, you know, um, uh, you know, even, even cocaine, you know, which is, you know, so something that's supposed to be super addictive. You know, it's kind of like, to me, it was, it was, you know, I, I wasn't taking it to, to, to party all night. I was taking it to survive, <laughs> you know, <laughs> make sure I didn't fall asleep at the damn steering wheel, you know, on my way home. Right. Uh, and so, you know, like, that's why like, uh, I remember there was a couple of times where, you know, and again, Steve, you know, he'd be in a car and I'd be in another car, you know, and I'd, I'd come up on him or you know, and flash my lights and, you know, pull up, you know, and, and, um, and, and, and he rolled down the window and I said, I need a little help. <laughs> <laughs> he knew what I meant. And he said, pull over, you know, so we pull over and, and he, you know, and he'd give me a shot. It's what was funny is 
he used to he used to put cocaine in like a prescription bottle, right? Mm-hmm. And what he would do is he would take the top off and he would just put a little bit in the in the in a cap in the top of the thing. Yep. And and and, and then he'd give you a little straw, and you would just take a, a you know, you would just take take part of, of what he put in the cap. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So <laughs> he did this. He puts it in the he puts it in the cap and gives me the straw. And I just took the cap and went. <laughs> <laughs> he went what? <laughs> I said, thanks, Steve. I am good to go. <laughs> oh, man. That's all you needed. You know, I, I think back about those days and, you know, you know, gosh, it was, it was wild. Uh, well, let's get to the uncensored pay-per-view. Team NWO gets the win defeating Team Piper, which is basically Piper and the Four Horsemen, and Team WCW, which is the Giant Luger Scott St- and just Scott Steiner because Rick was injured. The real excitement comes after the match when Sting comes down from the ceiling and finally makes it clear that he hates the NWO by beating up all the members. Ted, you were not at this pay-per-view, but I am curious whenever I hear about this. You know, Sting rappelling down from the ceiling. I, I want to say that this was the first or one of the first times that he would do that. Was that if you had been asked at any point in your career, hey, we want to we want to harness you up here and uh, have you drop down from the ceiling? Is that something you would have been willing to do? Uh, you know, I maybe, yeah. I mean, uh, I just don't know where that would have ever fit into anything that I did. <laughs> You it's know, probably uh, not really a million dollar man thing. Uh, um, because I, I know they, they did that. They did some of that at other shows too. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it was just sting. Uh, I don't know. But that, that, that's where the old sting thing, I think took off. Uh, that was a big, big part of his presentation, him like hanging out in the rafters and then he'd come down out of nowhere. And it was really cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, Ted, I know that this isn't an Ask Ted Anything episode, but there's something I'd love to ask right now, and it seems like the perfect time. Um, Ted, are you ready to talk about erections? I am, and namely, I'd like to talk about how our listeners can get stiffer than a punch from a loaded glove, thanks to Blue Chew. (laughs) I had you thinking I was going to keep talking about wrestling. No, sir. We are talking about Blue Chew here, and uh, Blue Chew can help increase your performance and, re- and regain that old confidence where it counts. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready when the opportunity arises, if you will. The process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive the prescription within days. The best part, it's all done online, so no more awkward visits at the doctor's office, no weird conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made right here in the U.S. of A. and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package, but as we all like to say, there won't be anything discreet about your package. You'll get that rascal so hard you won't be able to turn the head with a pipe wrench. <laughs> Hey, I want some. <laughs> yeah, all right. I mean, I'm, uh, it's a hard sell, brother. We, we want our fans, our listeners yeah. to enjoy better sex. <laughs> and listen, I know what your next question is. Will it actually work? Well, why don't you try it out for free and find out yourself? That's right. You, you can get something free from the Million Dollar Man. Uh, all you have to do is pay $5 shipping. Place your order now and give your partner a very pleasant surprise. I, I can just see it now. I mean, this is courtesy of the Million Dollar Man. <laughs> Ted's going to be getting, like, emails from people's lives, like, thank you. Thank you, Ted. Uh, and look, we all know that women are attracted to confidence, and Blue Chew can help give you confidence where it counts. Do not wait any longer. Brother, it's time to chew it and do it. Take advantage of our special deal. Again, you can try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code EGAP at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. 
That's BlueChew.com, promo code EGAP to receive your first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank BlueChew for sponsoring the podcast. I can see all the fans. Man, you gotta you gotta watch Ted DiBiase's podcast, man. He's 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 uh, he's he's selling hard on pills. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna get people coming up to you after this at, at conventions oh, yeah. oh, and whatnot, yeah. and shaking your hand a little extra with a little extra firmness, if you will. Saying, hey, "Thanks, brother." Well, as long as all right. As long as that's all they're shaking. <laughs> As long as they haven't taken a blue chew before they walk up to the table, too. We don't need that. Um, all right. So with the erection talk out of the way, let's let's move back into this. Well, it's a quick turnaround from uncensored to spring stampede, and seeds are being planted by Nash on the way that there may be some issues in the NWO. One real life issue was that Scott Hall had taken some time away to deal with some personal issues and checked himself into rehab during this period. Uh, which turned a tag team match at Spring Stampede into a singles match between Nash and Rick Steiner. So Scott Hall's issues have been pretty well documented over the years. But Ted, <clears> I'm <throat> curious, as a guy who spent plenty of time around Scott over the years, what were you seeing as far as substance abuse or intoxication? Well, I, uh, I mean, I, I saw it. I mean, uh, and um, but in, in spite of that, you know, personally, he, he was a nice guy. I mean, he wasn't... Uh, he wasn't a bully. He wasn't, uh, I don't think he pushed his weight around or anything like that. I, mean, I know he, and, you know, I mean, he and, uh, Kevin were very, very close and, you know, but Kevin, I think was driving that ship mm. by and large and, uh, uh, Hey, you know, whatever rolls your socks up, you know, it's fine. But yeah, I'm a nice guy, but you know, I could, I could see that. I mean, I, you know, I could, I know, like, I, I, I kind of like going, you know, you guys are doing okay now, but I see, I could, I could see possible disaster down the road. Yeah. And it's, you know, that's kind of what happened. You know, Scott still had a lot of years left by the time he was out of active wrestling, you know, like he got brought into the WWE in 2002 and looked like he might be making another run, but then, you know, demons reared their head and kind of, you know, stopped that whole thing. And it's like, man, it's, Scott's one of those guys. He, uh, you know, the fans loved him no matter the circumstances. And anytime he was on screen, he was getting big reactions, even as a heel. Yeah. Uh, what do you think it was about Scott that made him connect so well with audiences? Well, he just, I mean, it's, it's like, here's the, it's the factor. And, and I don't care who you are. Uh, I, I have seen guys get in the ring and, uh, and have technically speaking a great match. But the one thing you can't teach anybody is charisma. You either have it or you don't. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have it, you know that you know uh, you know you can't teach it to anybody. You either have that. I, I just call it the it factor. It's kind of like uh, Tommy Rich. Tommy Rich, uh, you know, if you hear Tommy do his interviews and everything. It's like a good old farm boy, you know. Yeah. Uh, but Tommy had charisma, and that's why Tommy got over. I mean, you know, if I hadn't have had charisma, you know, and and in in any. You know, in, 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 like, in my boisterous, the million dollar man thing. <laughs> Listen, you little chicken head. <laughs> you know? Charisma. You, 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 if you don't have it, you know, you're not going to make it. Scott definitely had it. And, you know, he's one of those guys that uh, it's it, you kind of picture the ultimate professional wrestler. The handsome guy, huge, muscular, good promo. Uh, charismatic. I can, I can still see him taking that toothpick and pull. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> it's like it's like you can't you can't build a professional wrestler better than Scott Hall. Yeah, yeah. He had he had all of it, man. So man, uh, shame that shame that his issues kind of got in the way. Yeah. Do you feel like Scott's one of those guys that could have been world champion? He never held a world championship. Uh, do you think that he's a, the kind of guy who could carry a company? Uh he had the talent. Yeah, he definitely had the talent, you know, but, you know, again, um, the, any, any wrestling company is not going to put a world title on you unless they know that you're very well grounded, you know, that you're not out, uh, partying all night, every night and 
all that other stuff. Well, at Spring Stampede, you're at ringside for the Kevin Nash and Rick Steiner match, and we've got the final moments of it for our only clip this week. Let's have a look. Okay, you and Six are up on the apron, and you're taking the pad off the turnbuckle. Nick Patrick, with no sleeves, is up there, uh, kind of at a loss. He wants to put a stop to all this. Here we go. Nash is hoisting Rick up on his shoulder. And Snake Eyes in the corner on the exposed turnbuckle. Oh, boy. Rick is down and out. Nick is saying, go ahead, pin him. But Nash is not done yet. He's talking to you. He's saying he's going to do one more. Okay. Nash is hoisting Rick up again. Drops him on that turnbuckle again. Boy, that looked nasty. Took it right on the ear. Oh, and they're showing the exposed turnbuckle. It does look nasty. Shoving Nick Patrick out of the way. He's telling you one more. Boy, Nash isn't done yet. Okay, here we go. Ted, you're up on the turnbuckle. You're pleading your case. Telling Nash to, that's enough. It's time. Nash is not having it. He's telling you, he'll tell you when it's enough. Yeah, he's pissed. You don't really know what to do. Here we go, he's putting him up again. You're still on the apron. And Rick is down with another snake eyes. Oh, Ted, now you're getting into the ring. We're about to throw hands. Nope, but you are you are pleading your case. Nash is saying he's not done yet. All right, and you throw your hands up, and you're leaving. You're stepping out of the ring, and this is it, man. Kevin Nash and Six are pretty shocked. Yeah, you're flustered, walking up the ramp, kind of washing your hands of the situation as Nash drops Rick Steiner again. All right. So. I did. Uh, about to be a baby face. <laughs> Man, the, the the baby face turn, all the all the seeds are planted and uh you're you're teasing that departure from the NWO. I mean, Ted, you know, again, we've discussed it here, but years and years now at this point, dating back to the 80s, pretty much that entire time you have been a heel and now yeah. for the first time in in a, over a decade, you're going to turn baby. Oh, face. I mean, I mean, I was. Uh, I'm trying to think what year it was that I turned heel. So, and I turned I'm, on. J, and I turned on JYD in Mid South in 1983. Now I know that you were a baby face for a little while in uh, 19. I want to say it was 1985. Um, I think that actually you and Steve Williams have formed a babyface tag team for a little bit. Yeah, then you yeah. turned back heel, um, and you you had been a heel ever since. So 1985 to 97, 12 years of consistently yeah. being a heel. Yeah, yeah. So I so I mean, you know, when it, the time is there, and it's like, okay, now I'm going to be a babyface. Where you like, boy, is, I'm I'm kind of starting to feel the groove with being a heel. Like, uh, am I going to be able to pull this off, or were you pretty confident you'd be fine? Oh, I was I was pretty confident, and it, and it was just a. It was a, a managerial role. It's not like I was getting back in the ring to do anything. At, but, but that whole thing, the, the whole reason, I mean, you know, that I, I mean, I, I, I went to them. I said, look, this is, uh, I mean, again, I, we've already covered this, but I, you know, I was, I was making a lot of appearances on Christian television. And it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like, uh, and, and I know the fans, you know, uh, you know, they know it's a show, but it's kind of like when I would walk into a building or out of a building, you know, I was, I was, in, I was a character. Um, and I just felt like it would take the mystique away, you know, or, you know, okay. They, you know, somebody, somebody sees me as this heel, you know, manager, you know, on, on TV and then, and then they flip this, the channel and there I am talking about how much I love Jesus and what he, what, the, what difference he made in my life. And I just, you know, I said, you know, it probably, you know, I just, it was a suggestion. I said, you guys do what you want. I said, but you know, you might think about, 
you know, turn at me baby face. And they did. So. And, you know, it's like what you're saying there makes perfect sense. But I just want to give like some context to this whole thing. You know, the NWO is doing record numbers in wrestling as far as merch sales are concerned. It's the hottest yeah. angle in wrestling. And yeah. you are right in the thick of the action with these guys during in-ring promos and segments and ringside during matches. So you're getting a lot of visibility as a result of being part of the NWO. And, you know, I've even heard guys in the group at the time say that it felt like being a part of that, the Chicago Bulls during their, you know, championship run in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. But now here you are voluntarily saying, nope, I want out. I mean, was there any part of you that thought maybe it might be best to remain with the group because of their high profile position? Marcus, to be honest to you, by that time, I wasn't, you know, it was kind of like my heart wasn't there anymore. Mm. You know, I mean, I, I had a, I had, you know, of course, you know, the, 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 here's the difference. I had a three year, no cut contract and I got paid progressively more for those three years. When those three, and I knew when those three years were up, I'm, I was done. I mean, I was done with the business because my whole life had shifted, you know, to you know, the most important thing in, in my life now was. You know, let's open the doors. And, and, and all wrestling was for me at, at that time and then going forward uh, was, you know, whatever I, however, you know, I was known from my past or, you know, this is, you know, I, I, I put it this way. I, I believe that God allowed me to have a measure of fame for a while so, because he knew one day instead of using that to promote myself, I would use it to promote him. Mm. And that's where I'm at today. So so the fame and all that stuff at this point, it was the money, all of it, it was all just kind of secondary to uh, yeah. your faith and, and what you really yeah. wanted to do. Yeah. Um, it, you don't have to give me any specific numbers, but if you had decided after this three-year contract was up, like, okay, I would like to retire uh, entirely, just not work anymore, were you in a position at that point where you could just have stopped? Not really, but, okay. but, but, but what I did have, it's like, I had, I had, well, I had faith that if, you know, if, and, and if, I, if I feel like I've been called to this, that God's going to open the doors and he did. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I was, you know, I was, I was traveling all over the country and in, and, 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 uh, I think I went to, uh, Oh gosh, where did I go? Um, I think I went to India. I think I took one trip to India. To I mean, as as a as, you know, and India. Oh my gosh! I mean, it's like the most highly. I mean, there's more. I think it's India. There's more people in in that one country than there is in three quarters of the world. Wow. I can't remember the number, but, and, you know, not a Christian nation at all. Uh, but I, you know, I took Christianity and, and I went with a group there and, and again, used my, and, and, and we even set up a ring and had a, gave the people a show, but I would, I would, then, then the ring became my platform to share the gospel. Man, pretty impressive stuff, because, uh, again, I think a lot of people are going to look at that and look at the NWO. Even today, it's still selling tons of merch. They're they're like one of the top sellers, tons of action figures, stuff like that, still centered around the NWO. So I think a lot of fans will look at you walking away from it and say, like, what is he out of his mind to leave the NWO? But the fact is that you got a, you had a higher calling and that's that's really admirable that you followed that path. Yeah. Well. And, I, you know, hey, and they're still making action figures of me, too. They are. So, hey, you uh, uh, there's another one that just came out. I, I said, really? Another one? <laughs> and by the way, you know, uh, WWE has the rights to Ted DiBiase and the rights to the NWO. So, like, I, I wouldn't be shocked if they made an NWO Ted DiBiase figure here down the road. Wow. Yeah. I, I, I would be willing to bet that they probably will. But yeah. in any case, uh, that is going to wrap us up for this week. We'll be back in action next week, and we're doing another fan-favorite edition of Ask Ted Anything. So drop your questions for Ted now on YouTube, social media, 
or you can hit me up directly in my DMs at Marcus P. D'Angelo on X. Before we go, I need to remind everyone, get over to YouTube at youtube.com slash at everybody's got a pod. Get subscribed. Ted and I have a lot of short clips over there, including YouTube exclusive clips that we put out there. And the Hacksaw Hour podcast with Hacksaw Jim Duggan lives, lives exclusively on that YouTube page. And if you haven't heard it, you're missing out on some amazing content from Jim. He's is still just as charismatic as he was with the WWF. You've got to check it out. It's free to subscribe and begin enjoying all the great stuff we have there. So go take a second right now and be part of it. Again, it's youtube.com slash at everybody's got a pod. Uh, boy, Ted, this, this episode was a blast. I do want to remind our listeners, too, that they can follow you on social at MDM Ted DiBiase on all platforms. Ted's really active on there recently, so I think you guys are going to like seeing what he does. And uh, again, you can follow and DM me at Marcus P. D'Angelo on X. Follow the podcast at Ted DiBiase Pod on all platforms. Ted, uh, it was great chatting with you here today and getting a look at your your new background there. You got a lot of really cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, uh, I got all my buddies in there. They're really that awesome. Yeah, that I, I don't that that thing is pretty cool. I can't remember who gave that to me. Uh, I oh, well, actually, I think that was uh, the the you know. Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame. Okay, yeah. In think, Waterloo, Iowa. I think that's the, I think they gave that to me. Well, the background is incredible. Looks awesome. And uh guys, we'll we'll be looking forward to chatting with you again here next week on the show. You betcha. And of course, as always, you must remember, one and all, that everybody's got a price for the million dollar man. <laughs> We will catch you guys next time right here on Everybody's Got a Pod.